Well, good morning, Ritman Grace. How are we doing today? It's good to be here with you. Uh, my name is Clark. I'm the pastor here. If we haven't met before, I'd uh, love to meet you and love to meet your family after service today. So feel free to stick around in the lobby and have some conversation afterwards. Well, we are in a series on the crucifixion. Actually started this a couple weeks ago. And kind of the goal of this sermon series at the beginning, we said this, that basically we know that the heart of the Christian faith at the heart of the Christian faith stands the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. But why exactly is that, is the question we're asking. What is the death of Jesus in this way saying to us about God? What is it saying to us about the world? What is it saying to us about ourselves? So in this series, what we want to kind of do is explore the meaning and the significance of the death of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. So if you're just now jumping in with us, we're in week three now. So to recap a little bit, in the first week, we talked all about the scandal of the crucifixion. Last week, we looked at the shame of the crucifixion in Isaiah 53. And today, we want to continue our series together and look at the severity of the crucifixion. Well, my guess is that we're all familiar with the basic principle of justice. We hear this phrase tend to be said a lot, the punishment needs to fit the crime. Right? The punishment needs to fit the crime. Uh, in other words, you wouldn't treat a 14-year-old making a bad decision the same way that you would treat a hardened criminal, hardened career criminal. So in any case, in any situation, a basic principle is that the punishment must fit the crime. So the question for us this morning, for followers of Christ, what crime have we committed that demands the scandalous and the shameful crucifixion of the Son of God, Jesus Christ? We've been thinking in this series of the crucifixion a lot. Now think about it this way. Jesus did not come to do 2,000 hours of community service in our place. Jesus did not come to spend time in a minimum security prison in our place. Rather, Jesus Christ came to earth to be tortured and beaten and shamed and scorned and hung naked on a cross in our place. So what sort of predicament are we in that demands that kind of remedy? How do we make sense of the severity of the crucifixion? Fleming Rutledge says it this way, The crucifixion of Jesus is of such magnitude that it must call forth a concept of sin that is large enough to match it. Or to say it another way, the severity of sin, or excuse me, the severity of the crucifixion shows us the severity of sin. So that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. We're going to talk about sin. And I know you're thinking, I didn't expect to hear a message about sin coming to a church. But in all seriousness, I want to sharpen and clarify our thinking biblically about the nature and the problem of sin. And here's sort of kind of the big idea of today's message. If you're taking notes, you can write this down. I want us to see this morning that sin is a power that must be defeated, not just a habit that needs to be broken. I want us to see today, and I think we're going to see in Romans 7, sin is a power that must be defeated, not just a habit that must be broken. So I want to magnify our vision of what Jesus is accomplishing on the cross by helping us see today that he is breaking the power of sin, not just delivering us from the habits and the patterns of sin. And now a statement like this, is always spoken into a context. I don't want us to misunderstand what I'm saying today. The reality is sin is a habit that must be broken. And I know that we're at a church here that knows that full well. Uh, we're a church that's committed to the reformation of our hearts and our lives. In other words, my guess is for many of us, if I asked you, what does it mean to walk with Jesus Christ and to seek to become new and different in Jesus Christ? the majority of you would probably say it looks like a fight and it looks like a struggle and a battle against the sin in our lives and also the particular patterns and habits that we've fallen into, the ruts that sin's created in our particular lives because of our story. So I think for most of us who attend this church, we have the category of sin as a habit that needs to be broken, and that's true. But the problem is this, unless that effort is grounded in the cross of Christ and in the power of the Holy Spirit, it's going to be relatively futile. So my hope this morning 
is to strengthen, strengthen our understanding of sin. And not just as a habit that needs to be broken, but as a power that needs to be defeated and disarmed and destroyed. Because when we see sin that way, we're going to begin to gain a much bigger appreciation and a much bigger picture of what Christ is accomplishing for us in the crucifixion. So I want our battles against the habits and patterns of sin in our lives to be rooted in in joy and grace and power because we know that the victory that's been won for us at the cross of Jesus Christ. So that's a big idea today. Sin is a power that must be defeated, not just a habit that must be broken. If you have a Bible, I want to invite you to turn with me to the passage that Sam read earlier in our scripture reading, Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7, I want to invite you to turn there. And if you don't have a Bible, we'll have the words up on the screen for you. Uh, Romans The book of Romans is a theologically dense book. It's probably the most closely reasoned epistle in the New Testament. And we're just going to dive right into the middle and come right in the middle of one of the arguments that the Apostle Paul is making. I've heard it said this way once, the Old Testament is about the anticipation of Christ. The Gospels are about the manifestation of Christ. Acts is about the proclamation of Jesus Christ. And Paul's writings are about the explanation of Jesus Christ. So if you think there's a lot of explaining today, it's because there is. And that's what Paul's doing. He is explaining what it means to have faith in Jesus Christ. So that's what we're looking at today in Romans. And as we uh, dive right in the middle of this passage, I'm going to try to do the best I can to kind of zoom out a little bit and help you understand the context of the case that Paul's making here. So we could better enter into the logic of this passage But the point that we're after, the thing that we're trying to get our minds around this morning, is the understanding that sin is a power in our lives that needs to be defeated, not nearly as habits that need to be broken or changed. So Romans chapter 7, breaking in at verse 7, here's what it says. The Apostle Paul, What shall we say then? Is the law sinful? So here's kind of the context of this rhetorical question that he's asking here. When he says... What shall we say then? Is the law sinful? The Apostle Paul is describing the difference between obedience that's driven by the law and obedience that's driven by the Spirit of God. And so Romans chapter 7 verse 6 tells us that Christ has released us from the law so that now our service and our obedience is powered by the Holy Spirit and not by the law. So the question is, if the law is something that we needed to be released from, Does that mean the law is something bad? And Paul answers that question in verse 7. Is the law something bad? Paul says, certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was, was, was had it not been for the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded me, afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of coveting. For apart from the law, sin was dead. So notice, this is our first clue to the idea that sin is a power. Notice in verse 8, speaks of sin as an active agent. Paul says, sin seized an opportunity. Seized an opportunity because sin is the acting subject here in this verse. Here's the case, the logical argument or connection that the Apostle Paul and the Holy Spirit through him are wanting us to make today. God's law says you shall not covet. That's the tenth commandment. If you know your Bibles in Exodus 20, we see the tenth commandment, you shall not covet. And that commandment in itself is good and it's holy and a beautiful thing. In fact, our church did a whole sermon series on the Ten Commandments last summer, if you remember. And what we said is that these are not rules that are intended to be hanging over us and weighing us down It's not meant to be restrictive. It's actually liberating. Rather, if you just look at the Ten Commandments, what you quickly discover is that it's God's prescription for a life that's that's freeing and flourishing. And if we all just live by the Ten Commandments, our lives would be amazing and society would be amazing. But these are just baseline principles for a life of flourishing. So God, the commands of God in and of themselves are beautiful. And they're noble and good and right and wonderful. But sin takes that commandment, which in itself is something good, and uses it as a tool for evil. So let me explain 
What I mean by that is just think about it this way. Let's just say that we're walking around the school here in Rittman, and we're on Metzger, and all of a sudden you come across a sign in the devil strip, uh, and, and, and that sign, it says this, please keep off the grass. Right? We've seen signs like this before. Please keep off grass. Suddenly, what do you want to do? You want to walk on the grass. That's what I want to do, if I'm being honest. And you wonder, why is this grass in particular something that I need to keep off of? What is it about this grass that requires this sign like this to be posted? What if I walked on the grass? Would someone see? Would I get in trouble? Who is making this prescription? If that sign had not been there, you probably wouldn't have even thought about it. But as soon as that prohibition is made, now the existence of that prohibition sort of awakens something in us. And we're like, why can't I walk on that grass over there? Well, as silly as that is, if you can get your head around that, that's what this text is talking about. That's a really silly example, but we have God's law in the Tenth Commandment telling us not to covet. And what happens is this. Sin, as Paul says, seizes an opportunity to produce in you all kinds of covetousness, to awaken in you all kinds of ways to break the commandment. Now notice what Paul says next in verse 9. Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. For sin, here it is again, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me, and through the commandment, put me to death. So notice again, sin is the subject, in other words, the agent. Verse 12, so then the law is holy and the commandment is holy, righteous and good. So notice the distinction that Paul's making here in this passage. God's law and God's rules, his commands, they're good, they're holy, they're righteous. In other words, it's not the law that's the problem, it's sin that's the problem. It's not the law that's the problem. It's sin that's the problem. Sin is the enemy that needs to be defeated. Sin is this corrupting power that needs to be destroyed. Watch what happens next. Paul says, Did that which is good, then, in other words, God's law, become death to me? By no means. Nevertheless, in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it used what is good to bring about my death so that through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. So don't miss that last phrase there. It's the language of slavery, the language of bondage. I'm sold under sin, Paul says. I'm a captive that needs to be set free. So notice what he says next in verse 15. I do not understand... What I do, for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate to do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. How many of you can resonate with that statement? I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. Don't you find yourself in that place sometimes? Here's the reality. We're not meant to stay there. As followers of Christ, as Christ followers, we're not meant to stay there. That's not where we are to live. This is not describing the normal Christian life. It's describing something that every one of us experiences. But it's not meant to be our permanent reality. The text is working us towards the solution to this conflict. To say it another way, Romans chapter 8 comes after Romans chapter 7. Romans 7 is not where the Bible ends, thankfully. The Bible does not end, and the book of Romans does not end, saying, I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. So where the gospel and the grace and the good news of the cross wants to get us is this. It's saying, I actually have the ability to do what I desire to do. 
which is right. Again, Romans 8 comes after Romans 7. So it's important that we're able to name this in our own experience, that we personally, we know personally that conflict between having a desire, in other words, knowing what is right, but not being able to do it. But we're not meant to live there. We're not meant to stay there. Because notice what Paul says next in verse 19. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So can you see what the culprit is? Can you see what the problem is? It's sin. And notice the distinction that the text makes between I and sin. It is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. So that distinction is made. Here's what I know to be right. In other words, here's what I want. Yet sin lives within me. So don't miss this. Here's why this is so important. You are not your sin. You are not your sin. Your sin does not define you. And by God's grace, your sin will not define you. It is not your identity. What this text is telling you, and me and all of us this morning, is that sin is holding you captive. Sin is an occupying power, and sin has taken ground in your life and in your being. Sin has you under its thumb, and you need to be set free. And now he's been talking about the law, the commandments of God... But notice this play on words in verse 21 now. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. Amen. Here's the reality. Here's what's true in the world. When I want to do right, guess what? Evil is right there with me. Because the choice between good and evil is right there in front of us every day. Verse 22, for in my inner being I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work within me, waging war against the law of my mind, making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am! Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Christ, Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself, in my mind, am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. So this whole text, the point of all this, is for us to enter into the reality that we were made in the image of God, that we were made to love what God loves, want what God wants, and to desire what God desires. And yet, we live in a fallen world. We live under the influence of sin, and as a result, we are a conflicted person. So so you're not merely a a sinner who does what is wrong. You're a captive who needs to be delivered. Sin is not merely a verb. It's also a noun. And it says right here in verse 23, making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. Sin is not merely individual acts of disobedience. It's an enemy whose power needs to be broken. And that's why the crucifixion of Jesus is such good news. So at this point, we're going to turn a corner now. We're going from Romans 7 to Romans 8. And it's all about to turn into all good news now. Paul's been talking about the reality which sin controls us and sin corrupts us. And so now, what we're going to see is that this is why it's such good news that God sent Jesus. Romans 8. Therefore... There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has, what? Say it with me. Set you free from the law of sin and death. So catch this. What it's saying is this. In Christ Jesus, here's what's happened. There's no condemnation for you. The penalty of sin has been removed, but also, you've also been set free. Notice in verse 3 now. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. 
And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us. We do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So notice what he says there in verse 3. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did. Paul says that there's something the law cannot do. There's a lot that the law can do, but there's also something that the law can't do. And here's what the law can do. It can tell you how you ought to live. The law can do that. The law can tell you the way God has designed human life to work. It can tell you what is good and what's noble and what's right and what's true, and it can give you a picture of the life that you ought to live. The law can certainly do that. And in doing so, it's good and beautiful and it's right and it's true and it glorifies God and that's, it's meant to help you. But there's something that the law can't do, Paul says. Here's what the law can't do. It can't defeat the power of sin. It can't destroy the occupying enemy. And it can't set you free from sin's rule over you. It can tell you the person that you ought to be but it has absolutely no power to make you that kind of person, which is why God sent his own son. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. You notice, to be a sin offering. To be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh. So once again, the law can show you how to live. God's commands can give you a great template for what your life ought to look like. They have no power to make your life look like that. And also, guess what? That's why God sent Jesus. That's why Jesus went to the cross. That's why Jesus rose from the dead. And that's why Jesus sent the Holy Spirit. So that in you and me, the righteousness, the righteous requirement of the law, this good and noble way that God has told us we are to live, might be fulfilled. How? As we walk according to the Spirit. So let's not miss that connection between the Son and the Spirit in this passage. God sent His own Son to defeat sin in order that we might now walk in accordance with the Holy Spirit, that we might have a new source of power and life and energy flowing through our being and giving us the ability to do the thing that we want to do which is to glorify God and walk in his ways. In Christ, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, this empowering presence of God dwelling within you to give you the ability to do what's right. And that part of, uh, that's, that's part of what Christ was doing as he hung there on the cross, securing our freedom from sin and sending the Holy Spirit upon the church to change everything, to give us the ability to do what the law could never do give us the power and the ability to do. So why was Jesus' death so severe? Why did our salvation require the suffering and the death of the Son of God? It's because sin had dominion over us. It's because we were slaves and captives. Jesus didn't just die for sins. He died for sin. To defeat its power, to deliver us from its bondage, and to break its hold on us. So think about it this way. There's a subtle difference between the word sins and sin, isn't there? You need to be forgiven for your sins. I need to be forgiven for my sins, the things that you've actually done to disobey God and to bring harm into the world. Your sins need to be forgiven. But you also need to be set free from sin. The power that has sway in the world because of the fall we need its hold to be broken. We need to be set free from its bondage. And that's what Jesus has done in his life and in his death and in his resurrection. So rightly understood, Romans chapter 7 and the good news that God had triumphed over sin by sending uh, for us his son for sin to break its power over us and to set us free from captivity. That changes how we celebrate Good Friday and Easter. At least it ought to. And here's how I hope it changes the way that we walk through the next couple weeks together as a church. One of our biggest problems and challenges as American Christians is individualism. We live in a very individualistic society. Only secondarily do we understand 
that we have connection to other people. So for most of us, as we approach Good Friday and Easter, we're thankful because Jesus died for our sins. We're thankful because Jesus rose again and that we have eternal life. And is that true? Yes, it's absolutely true. And praise God for that. That every single one of us, as an individual who trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ, has our sins forgiven and has been promised the gift of eternal life. And that is glorious good news. However, that's not the only thing that we need to celebrate. As we move towards Good Friday and as we move towards Easter, I also want us to celebrate and be thinking about the we. We have been set free from the power of sin. This is good news, not just for you, it's for the person across the room who has a totally different life than you, and a totally different struggle than you, and a totally different temptation than you. And the good news for you is that Jesus has delivered them too from the power of sin. And that gives us hundreds of more reasons to worship and celebrate than just, I know that Jesus has set me free. But if Jesus has set us free, if he's delivered from captivity, if he's delivered us from bondage, what a great reason we have to celebrate and to rejoice, to lean in in prayer and encouragement for one another as we walk this out together. So because of the crucifixion, we who belong to Jesus are no longer slaves. Because of the crucifixion, sin, sin's power over us is broken. Because of the crucifixion of Jesus, every one of us is free to live a new life, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And because of the crucifixion, nobody's sin will ever have the last word. No one will remain in bondage who hopes in the Lord Jesus Christ because sin is a power that needs to be defeated not just a habit that needs to be broken. And through the death and resurrection of Jesus, that power has been broken. So we have been set free from the dominion of sin. So let's pray and thank Jesus for his victory. Well, Jesus, we thank you that you have accomplished what the law cannot do that you've conquered and defeated sin and set us free from captivity and bondage. And we get to walk in freedom and not bondage. And Lord, I just pray for the person who has never experienced your delivering power, that maybe today would be the day that he or she would put a stake in the ground and surrender through faith and repentance in you. And for the rest of us, Lord, just give us the grace to rejoice to delight. Help us to see with clarity the wonder and beauty of the cross and the resurrection. Lord, I pray for a harvest of obedience and joy and worship and service and honor to you. And I pray this for our good and for your glory. Amen.